I always loved my parents' record collection. Well, their Beatles, Stones and Shadows records, not their Nana Muscuri and John Denver. There's something about vinyl, singles especially. There's the ritual of putting them on the turntable, and it's only three or four minutes long. You might as well give them your undivided attention. I always felt there was something wonderfully, creepily weird about 50s and 60s music. Dream. The Everly Dream. Brothers, the Shangri-Las, the Crystals. Dream. 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 Well, I want you. Long before David Lynch started to use Roy Orbison on his soundtracks. And all your charms whenever I want you. All I have to do is dream, 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 dream. I first became seriously interested in music in 1979. I was 12, and I'd started to record songs from off the radio. But, as with digital files today, just being able to listen to a song wasn't quite good enough. I wanted to own a physical copy. I went down to Woolworths to buy I Don't Like Mondays by the Boomtown Rats. I was born just a little too late for punk, but any kind of music is always special when you first discover it as a teenager with little knowledge of what's gone before. I discovered punk retrospectively, and it was still a recent enough phenomenon to inspire anger amongst the generations above me, which had to be the best possible recommendation. But all music, at that age, is a doorway into new worlds, new experiences, new emotions. I first got into music with what was called New Wave and Post-Punk. I remember sitting in a friend, Steve Dan's, bedroom, listening to Adam and the Ants, Kings of the Wild Frontier, and going down to Woolworths to buy Searching for the Young Soul Rebels by Dex's Midnight Runners. I was a big Blondie fan. I like to squeeze. And I adored Toya. One of the arguments for vinyl over CDs, and certainly over digital music, is album artwork. I'd get to know it all intimately wondering who on earth Ronnie Toast was, quoted on the back of the first Blondie album, and imagining what the unused lyric on their parallel lines inner sleeve would sound like if Debbie Harry had sung it. There were still a few clues to be had from amongst my parents' collection. A Reader's Digest box set included Voodoo Child by Jimi Hendrix, and I bought his Smash Hits album second-hand on Eastbourne Market. I was lucky enough to have friends a year older than me who introduced me to all kinds of other music. Without Steve Dan and Nick King, I wouldn't have got into the fall when I did or the Dead Kennedys, or the Buzzcocks, or the Birthday Party, or the Television Personalities, or the Barracudas. But I'd started taping John Peel's radio show by then, and I heard him play the Smiths for the very first time. And the 10,000 Maniacs. I didn't have much disposable cash, 
and rather than spend 99p on a chart single, I was often tempted by five singles from the 20p section in Max Records in Eastbourne instead, or ten second-hand singles for 10p each from the back room of the camera shop in Hailsham. Those sources yielded all kinds of treasures and oddities. My Baby Takes Valium by Family Fodder, The Terraplane Fixation by Animals and Men, Rubber Cars by The Wasps. That's where Nick discovered the Peter Paints His Fence EP by The Instant Automatons, Witch Hunt by The Mob, and Nice To Be Back by Oxy and the Morons, and some of those took me several decades to track down for myself. I remember seeing a video of the Cramps on the TV show, The Tube, performing Garbage Man and being desperate to get songs the Lord taught us. My interests were pretty wide ranging. At the same time that I was listening to the Cramps, I'd already got into Kate Bush and she had become my first serious collecting obsession. I bought the kick inside from a small independent record and bookshop in Heathfield High Street called Jabberwocky, using very limited Christmas present money. They're all individual songs on the kick inside, but they seem to be combining to tell some story about another world that I couldn't always fully understand. I'd got into listening to albums with my headphones on, lying on my bed, in the dark and engaging with music in a way that I just don't have the time to do today. But then, as now, it all came back to vinyl. And it comes back to sound quality. An MP3 played on a good system will always sound superior to a poor vinyl record, but a record that's been cared for played on a decent record player, does sound warmer. It sounds better than a digital file. Analog offers a richer sound than the approximation of digital. Well, I think so. But then I also have a fondness for the warmth of old cassette tapes, and I know that that is an appalling format. From reading about Blondie, I discovered the Talking Heads, and the Ramones, and television and their sublime Marquee Moon album. From Blondie I discovered the Gun Club, and from the Gun Club I came across Bo Diddley. I'd got into Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, courtesy of a tenpence copy of Messages found in the camera shop in Hailsham, and I believed OMD to be great pioneers of electronic music, not knowing for a few years just how much of a debt they owed to Kraftwerk. I took my sister Jo to see them on the Dazzle Ships tour in 1983, and I was blown away by the support act, the Cocteau Twins. I went to Brighton the next weekend and brought their Peppermint Pig single and the album Garlands and then I went back to Brighton again to buy the same single as a 12 inch for just that one extra track and then their lullaby is 12 inch. When the Cocteau Twins brought out Head Over Heels and Sunburst and Snowblind my favourite band had just got even better. Elizabeth Fraser's unreal vocals and the amazing guitars created such astounding pictures in my head. And 4AD's enigmatic album artwork was just wonderful. I saw the Cocteau Twins again in December 1984, amidst the very faded and decaying grandeur of the Brighton Dome before it was renovated. They played the music from their album, Treasure. In 1983, we discovered Psychic TV's Dreams Less Sweet and Force the Hand of Chance. Hand 
These were very strange records. But at the same time, we were listening to the Bonzo Dog Doodah band's Canesham, and somehow all these different records seemed to make sense together. No, no! Please, not the leg! I found the men, sir. God, I wish I hadn't. When I went to Sheffield University, I got the chance to listen to an even wider variety of music. I discovered plenty of material from the past that I hadn't got into my parents' collection, including The Doors and The Velvet Underground. And I got to see, live, The Jesus and Mary Chain, My Bloody Valentine, The Gun Club, The Pixies. I bought my music at the Record Collector in Broom Hill and Rare and Racy on Devonshire Street. I went out and bought Little Girl with Blue Eyes by Pulp after seeing them at the Maze Bar and thinking that they sounded like the Velvet Underground. You're just a little girl with blue eyes Everybody looks at you Well, it's your day I am quite convinced that vinyl will be around for some time yet. Other formats have come and gone. Reel to reel, eight tracks, cassettes, mini discs, laser discs, and it's hard to see CDs surviving. They're an unsatisfactory compromise between a physical artifact, like a vinyl record, and the undoubted usefulness of digital vinyls. There is something about vinyl records that offers a tangible, physical link to the time, place, and the people that you were with when you bought them. Listening to PJ Harvey would always remind me of when I first met my partner, Rosalie, because she was a huge fan. R.E.M.'s Fables of the Reconstruction was introduced to me by Mark Johnson. I remember him buying the Pixies Come On Pilgrim on the strength of a review in a music paper, and we both sat in his room, in the dark, listening to it together at full volume and realising that we were listening to something very special. And I think that it was around Steve McKevitt's house that I first heard Sonic Youth's album Sister. Having the vinyl and the full-size artwork is a part of the whole experience of engaging with the music and the band. The only downside is with a record like Sonic Youth's brilliant Daydream Nation, which is ideally played from start to finish without the breaks required to flip sides and change between two discs. It's been reissued, apparently, as a four disc set, which is even worse. Today I buy records from various sources, and I work very part-time in Better Days Record Shop in North Allerton, from which I invariably come home with all kinds of weird and wonderful records from the last five decades. At this point, I'd better give Gary, Howard and Jim name checks and thank them for their various recommendations, and my son, Tim, who has made a number of musical discoveries for himself that is passed on to me. But it's not just about nostalgia. In the last decade, I've been astounded by in the Aeroplane Over the Sea by Neutral Milk Hotel, along with The Age of the Understatement by The Last Shadow Puppets, and Their Refinement of the Decline by Stars of the Lid, Let England Shake by PJ Harvey, Helplessness Blues by Fleet Foxes, and Hoping for the Invisible to Ignite by Farewell Poetry, and Sinead O'Connor's wonderful How About I Be Me and You Be You, just when I think I don't really need to buy any more records, something else is issued, or reissued.